Let me say good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we continue our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we slowly reach the finish line in, in chapter 10. Um, thank all of you for joining us tonight. Please continue to be prayerful in our study and continue to be receptive to the Spirit of God as He open our eyes as we study His Word so that we uh, might pray Psalms 119 to open our eyes that we may behold the wondrous things out of that law that we might receive clarity in our reading and as we study what Paul has to say to the church at Corinth. Um, I pray that you would continue to remember your brothers and sisters, uh, especially those who are sick and shed in, especially those who have recently lost loved ones like Sister Kaiser, Sister Hill, and uh, Sister Slade and others who have lost loved ones, that you would continue to remember them in a special way, that you might be in prayer for the um, youth and children ministry, that the Lord will continue to use those who are leading that ministry. Uh, and, then on, and then on Saturday, we... Uh, we have the uh, Queen Esther Auxiliary that oh, is uh, offering a opportunity for Moving ministry. For grace. Uh, for grace. I would that uh, you would uh, mute your uh, laptops, your phones, etc. I think Reverend Campbell. Uh, Ms. Graham was trying to correct. It's not Queen Esther, Margaret Graham. Who is doing Saturday? Women Progressive? The Women okay. Women's Progressive okay. Club. The Great Women Possess Pro Progressive. Thank you, Sister Graham, uh, for that. Uh, I won't get in no trouble. So, thank you so much for that. I think that began, Sister Graham, I think they told me at 11.30 uh, on Saturday, the uh, women progressive. So thank you for that correction. Um, let us begin as we always do with prayer. Lord, thank you tonight for the opportunity to uh, study your word tonight and as we read your word and seek understanding of your word i pray oh god that you would grant clarity and understanding um, that we might grow stronger in our study of the word that we might be more like jesus each day of our lives that we may be uh men women boys and girls of uh, prayer, forgiveness, love, and um, as we show forth our walk with Jesus Christ so that some man, woman, boy, girl might see the Jesus that's in us. So I thank you, O oh God, for what you have done for us, what you have done to us, and for what you have done through us. Thank you again for the ministry called First Baptist Holland Avenue. I thank you for all of the members and officers and auxiliaries, as well as members who make up that ministry. I pray your blessings upon them in a special way. Now grant your spirit to be our guide as we study your word on this night. It is in Jesus' name, amen. On last week, uh, we made it through verse 24 and 
25 and 26. And one of the things that Paul emphasized was that you and I are, uh, you and I should, I should say, always be reminded that we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. We are witnesses every day of our lives. Paul is wrapping up a response to the question about eating food that has been offered to idols. He reminds us that all food is created by God and that every gift is also from God. He simply tags it that the earth is the Lord and everything therein, which is the foundation of all that we know. Uh, Paul told the church at Colossae that all that was made was made by him and that nothing that was made has been made without him. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, whatever it is that we engage in, it is a result of what he has provided. Uh, he says in verse 27, if any one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Um, he continues that thought from verse 26. Um, because that was, that was just an ongoing question about uh, all of the uh, meat uh, was coming from the same market area. And some folks were buying meat to offer to idols as a part of the temple uh, worship. And then there were Christians who were also buying meat from the same place. Uh, but they were not asking, they were not offering that meat to uh, any particular idol. They were simply buying it for their own substance. And so the question was, since we are buying it from the same place, and some of it is being offered to idol, and then after whatever is being offered uh, has been rendered, then what's left over was being partaken of uh, by those who were present. And so some people who were not as strong in the ministry were questioning whether or not it was a matter of sin to partake of that same meat. And Paul says there's, there's, there's two schools of thought here. One is that the stronger Christians, they were very much aware that it had no bearing on their uh, Christian wall, where some who were not as strong thought that it was sinful to partake. And so the point Paul was making, has made, was that if you are strong in the faith, then be conscious be considerate of others because the number one job <clears throat> that all of us have is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. We are each day of our life is an opportunity to be uh, a witness. Um, so he says one of the things you might want to do is what he tells the church at Corinth is, you know, don't don't ask any questions. Just uh, proceed as normal uh, because it's not a sin for you as a believer, as a strong believer, because you know that there's no consequence, that it has no, no uh, barren. So don't put yourself in a position of embarrassment or a, question, a position of being questioned 
by raising questions whether or not the meat has been offered to idol. And if the answer is yes, then you refuse to eat it. Then that constitutes a problem uh, for those who you're trying to win over. So that's the point that he is hammering home here is that your job as a Christian is to be a witness and to try to win others to Jesus Christ. So in doing that, then you have to be considerate of others that if what you're doing might pose a stumbling block to a weaker Christian or a potential Christian, then the ideal situation is don't, don't partake, don't eat, so that you won't uh, be a stumbling block to the person that you're trying to win over to Jesus Christ, because it's a question of conscience, and you don't want to lose an opportunity uh, as a result of that. So in verse 28, uh, 29, and 30, Paul says, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. But why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that which I give thanks? And then in verse 31, he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So here, um, he's hammering home this idea of being considerate of others, the weaker believer that he's been talking about since uh, chapter 8. So he, he's warning his fellow believers that the meat that has been served, that has been offered to an idol, uh, be cognizant of that moment. Uh, uh, the stronger believers, although they know that it don't make any difference, uh, Paul is suggesting that you refrain from eating it out of consideration of the conscious. The conscious not of themselves, but the conscious of the weaker believer, because the weaker believer is taking the position that it is a sinful act. And so this, this weaker believer feels that in eating the meat, the Christian would be uh, sanctioning uh, the, uh, the eye of the worship. And so, uh, so Paul basically is repeating what he said already in chapter 8. And so since the weaker believer would conclude that when you eat that particular meat, then you're given sanction uh, to idol worship. And that's not what you want to do. That's not what you're doing. And that's not what you're trying to portray. So he is saying, be conscious of that. And so the same thing applies uh, to us in our daily Christian walk that how we, you know, he's really talking about behavior, uh, that uh, how we act in public, we need to be conscious of how we act in, in public because it may be offensive or it may cause, it may prove to be a stumbling block uh, to someone else. So how we act in worship, how we act in business meeting, how we act in our auxiliary, et cetera, uh, we have to be mindful as we are out in public to be mindful of what people witness from us because what the people do is that they consider what you and I may be doing and they make a determination from that. If they already have in their mind that 
something is wrong, something is questionable, then to see what you do, then they make a determination if that is in fact uh, what's going on. So be careful how you uh, deal with your brothers and sisters. Be careful about what you allow your brothers and sisters see you doing, see what you're saying, because they're going to make a determination uh, for Jesus Christ as a result of what they see you do and what you, they see you say. So then the question becomes, why, why should my freedom be uh, limited by what somebody thinks? You know, we are quick to say, you know, I really don't uh, care about uh, what somebody thinks, what somebody feels, and what somebody believes. Well, that's not the attitude that you really can have when you're talking about being a witness for Jesus Christ. Our one job is to go teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to tell folks whatsoever Jesus has said in his word, and to remember the promise that he's with us every step of the way. So in remembering that, then it can't be about yourself. It can't be about me. It has to be about him. And so uh, we, uh, you know, you might say, well, I'm acquiescing to this weaker believer in matters of conscious, uh, and I want to hold on to my freedom in Jesus Christ because it is freedom, and I don't want to use my freedom to be limited or to be determined by a weaker believer. Um, so when I thank God for provision, the food and drink, and I want to enjoy it. So uh, what you don't want to do is to allow yourself to be condemned for that freedom. So if somebody sees you doing something or saying something that is uh, that can be questioned, then it is can be viewed as using your freedom in a way that's going to hurt someone else. Because we got to remember that we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. And we got to remember that what we do and what we say ought to be to the glory of, of, of God. And so every now and then we have to uh, set aside our own liberties and freedom for the benefit of somebody else so that they uh, won't see us or receive us as a stumbling block. Um, so you may say, well, that seems like I'm going through a whole lot of trouble to put myself through to keep somebody else from uh, questioning, uh, complaining about the way that I carry myself. Well, that comes with the uh, with the territory. Uh, whether we like it or not, it comes with the the territory. Uh, the for example, um, the preacher cannot have a side chick. Now, I know when I say that, the first thing that 
you guys think about is your mind goes straight to the gutter and you think that I'm talking about another woman. No, I'm not. Let me tell you what a side chick can be to the preacher. A side chick to the preacher is when the preacher uh, becomes more interested in other things than the things of God. You know, how much money I'm going to be able to get, uh, what kind of house I'm going to be able to live in, what kind of car I'm going to be able to drive, what kind of clothes I'm going to be able to wear. Those are side chicks to the to the preacher. And when the preacher is more interested in money, housing, cars, and clothes, then that becomes his side chick. And as a result of that, it becomes a handicap to the preacher's ability to be effective in leading a ministry. Now, I do know, I do understand that you have been in situations or know of situations where that is, in fact, what happens. Well, wherever it happens doesn't make it right. Um, the Bible says that when the Lord told Solomon to ask anything, whatever he wanted to ask of God that the Lord would give to him. And so in thinking about what it is he could ask God for, your Bible says that of all of the things that he could ask for, he asked for wisdom. He asked for wisdom to lead his people, to lead the people of God, that is. And so the response of God was, because you didn't ask for material things, I'm going to give you not only what you asked for, so he gave him wisdom, and your Bible says that Solomon was the wisest man on the earth. He said, I'm going to give you that. He said, but because you didn't ask for material things, I'm also going to give you uh, riches untold, unlike anybody else would ever have, both then and in the days to come. So no one has as attained that type of material uh, possessions. But he didn't ask for material things. He asked for wisdom in order to lead the people of God. And so that's what I have to do. That's what you have to do. In our prayer life, one of the things that we should be asking for is wisdom. Wisdom to do the right thing in our Christian walk. What is the right thing to do? We don't always know uh, the right thing to do. In fact, we don't always know what to pray for. So the Bible says in Romans 8 that when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit is there to intercede on our behalf and pray the prayer on our behalf that we are unable to pray for whatever reason. So what the Bible teaches us is that don't just go in prayer about the big things, but also pray about the little things. Um, one of the things that I'm dealing with now is, uh, you know, gout in my right uh, left foot. And I've gone to the doctor twice now, and I've had x-rays, blood work. Uh, I also tomorrow go to a, a podiatrist because no one cannot seem to figure out uh, what the issue is. Uh, the, the primary doctor can 
determined that he thought it was gout. Well, I've taken all of the medication and I'm still limping. Well, that's easy. That's an easy prayer to pray for. That I would ask the Lord to uh, give me relief. I would ask the Lord to give the doctor the knowledge, the understanding that he needs in order to help me overcome uh, this foot issue because it is difficult to uh, walk. It is difficult to be normal uh, when you have pain in your foot. And I'm talking about pain that uh, you don't want to touch anything. Well, that's an easy prayer to do. The difficult prayer is, Lord, continue to use me even in the midst of my pain. And sometimes we focus so much on what it is that we want that we forget that it is really about what he wants. Because I have pain in my left foot, uh, that doesn't stop the Lord from using me. So uh, I still can talk, I still can speak, even in the midst of pain. It's, it's, it's similar to uh, what Paul said, he had this thorn in his side and he wanted relief. He was in pain, he was struggling, he was having problems. And the Lord said that, I don't need you to be pain free in order for me to use you. He said, because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so that is so true that even in the midst of pain, the Lord is still using me. He's using me to uh, prepare this um, uh, Bible study for tonight to go through this these scriptures that I intend to cover tonight and give me the insight I need in order to uh, explain uh, what Paul is talking about. He give me uh, determination and peace and wisdom and his spirit to also simultaneously continue to prepare a sermon for on Sunday. So what the Lord has revealed to me, uh, which is not new here, but I don't, he don't need me to be pain free in order to use me. So same thing applies to you, that whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is you're dealing with, the Lord can use you even in the midst of that difficulty. And so the prayer uh, should not just be about getting relief from the pain, but Lord, what can I do even in pain? And so uh, that again is a reminder that we are witnesses and that we are witnesses constantly. So every day, every hour, we have an opportunity to witness and we have an opportunity to share our faith as we come uh, into contact with our brothers and sisters or even as we think about our brothers and sisters. So uh, I was able to make some phone calls and pray for different people, even in the midst of the pain. So uh, you cannot be um uh, ignoring what God has called you to do just because you have some pain in your life. Because he reminds us again that whatever we do in uh, verse uh, 31, whatever we do, whatever it is that we say, 
He says that we're doing it to the glory of God. Do it to the glory of God. And then in verse uh, 32 and 33, he says, Give no offense to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. That's what a witness is hoping to accomplish, to lead someone to Christ so that they might receive the salvation of Jesus Christ. Um, this freedom, this liberty that the Lord has given to us, Paul is telling us that it is to be uh, it's not to be used to give offense. So we have to be conscious of whether or not we're saying something or doing something that's going to be offensive. But Paul's life was all about uh, winning other folks to Jesus Christ. And that ought to be our focus as well. His, his focus was always about what's best for others so that they might be saved. Nothing, not even his own liberty in Christ, uh, should cause him as a believer or you as a believer or I as a believer to lose sight of the fact that our desire is to win someone to Jesus Christ. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how good others think that you are, we are called to put others first and that must always be our focus that we are in this to help someone else come to know what we know. Um, the Bible talks about uh, the lepers who had made a decision that um, we are hungry, we are lepers, and we'll, we'll get ready to die. So they enter into this camp. They made the decision to enter into this camp of, 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 of enemies that they concluded, well, they're going to kill us, so we might as well go ahead and go on in there, and at least we'll get an opportunity to, you know, to get something to eat. What they didn't know was that the Lord had Cause those people to desert their residence and flee. And so when they got there, nobody was there. So they began to gorge themselves in food and drink. And then one of them recognized that, you know, this is, uh, this is not good. We have brothers and sisters back home who are hungry and thirsty and starving and having a hard time, we need to go back and tell them about this. And so uh, that's what they did. And so we got to do the same thing. If you have been blessed and you have been saved, then you ought to want to tell somebody else about it. Um, there's a story um, that I heard about uh, uh, I shared this once before and I'll share it again now and that is about this this black slave who served uh, these folks and uh, the house caught on fire and the young boy their young son was upstairs in the attic area and they were uh, panicking over their son thinking that if we don't find a way to get him out of there he's going to perish and so this black slave uh, a black man went sacrificed himself and went back in and saved the young boy and so the man and his wife decided that as long as they were alive, as long as they had that particular property, 
that this black man, this slave, would always have a place to live with his family. And so when they died off, uh, their son had grown up and inherited the place. And his uh, one of his first acts was to cast out uh, this black man and his family to put him out. And this black man, of course, was very elderly at this time, at this point. And so um, one day the young man uh, happened to go upstairs to the attic and saw this um, vault-like uh, basket, if you will, and he saw uh, a diary, and he began to read through it, and and he saw where his father had recorded the events where this black man had saved this young boy, and and what the promise had been made. So he began to cry, and uh, in his emotional state, he went running and uh, after the black man that he had put out. And he said to the black man, nobody had told me. Nobody told me. That's the, uh, that's the, perhaps the uh, most damaging thing that can be said about a Christian is that they never told anybody never told anybody how Jesus Christ had saved them, how Jesus Christ had freed them from the bondage of sin, how the Holy Spirit had regenerated their lives, that they are not no longer the person that they once was. Nobody told me. You can't you can't have that kind of testimony where you never told someone. So we are witnesses. We are obligated to tell someone. We are obligated to share our faith, share our lives, and the difference that Jesus made. You know what my life was uh, before I met Jesus. What happened when I met Jesus, and then what my life has been since I met Jesus. That's, that's a simple evangelistic testimony. Uh, Let's the, the, the say those three things. What my life was like before I met Jesus, what happened when I met Jesus, and what my life has been since I met Jesus. Very simple testimony. Uh, don't be guilty of someone being able to say that nobody told me, uh, especially somebody in your household, somebody in your family, somebody in your neighborhood. Somebody needs to know uh, the difference that Jesus has made in your life. And then you need to live in a way that reflects the difference that Jesus has made in your life. So we arrive at chapter 11 now, uh, verse 1, which is really a conclusion, if you will, of chapter 10. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Um, what he says here is that I'm following after the example of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, I exalt you to follow my example. Follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. And that's what uh, preachers and deacons and other church leaders ought to be saying to the rest of the congregation. You know, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Follow my Example, we have freedom in Jesus Christ 
but it is also our responsibility to be considerate and to love those who are not as strong in the faith as you and I may be. Uh, we all should be focusing on uh, bringing others to Christ. Uh, when he said that greater things than these thou shall do, that's what he's talking about. You have an opportunity to bring others uh, to him uh, in great numbers. Uh, and so the reason why we want to do that or should do that is because we'll be following his example. And that's what he did. He came into this world and he shared with us the things that his father had given to him. And the purpose of Jesus sharing those things is so that in his sharing of those things, we would commit ourselves to him as he has committed himself to the Father. And so Paul says, Jesus Christ has committed himself, submitted himself to the Father. I have committed myself, submitted myself uh, to Jesus Christ. So he says, follow my example. And so that is not hard to understand. That is not hard to determine because um, we should be modeling our model in ourselves after him. Uh, we should be following the uh, good example of those who have gone on uh, before us. You know, those who have invested in themselves, invested in the church, invested in Jesus Christ, invested in uh, prayer service, invested in worship, invested in Christian education. That's the model that we have that we should be imitating. You've heard me talk about <clears throat> growing up on South 13th Street. You know, there's a bunch of Christians on one side of the street and folks who didn't go to church that often, or if at all, on the other side of the street, and how we respected those on that side where we knew that they were real Christians, that they were real followers of Jesus Christ. And so people who know that that is your um, position, that know that that's what you represent, they will respect you in that regard, even though they may not be uh, ready to commit themselves, they may not be ready to follow after Jesus Christ, but they have enough wherewithal to um, give respect to your life. You are not hanging with them like, like you used to do. You're not uh, carrying yourself uh, like you used to do. And they could see the change that is in you. And so Paul says, be an example to your brothers and sisters. Uh, let them see that your life has been changed. Let them see that you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to do. We are forever witnesses for him. And so we are to be an example to the rest of the of the world. And so he says again in uh in in uh in verse one, be imitations, imitators rather, of me as I am an imitator of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul says here in that regard is that it's not about me. Uh, it's not me trying to uh, impress you. It's me simply trying to be like Jesus, trying to live for Jesus, trying to be an example uh, to you, trying to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And so that's what he 
that's the response that he's giving to them. Uh, this church at Corinth, who had written him asking this question about eating uh, meat that has been previously offered to idols. So that's his response to all of that. But in chapter 11, he's, he's focusing on uh, something else. He's, he's focusing in chapter 11 on the uh, proper attitudes and uh, conduct that you should exhibit in worship. So he's, he's not dealing with marriage anymore. He's not dealing with uh, the role of women in the church. He's talking about now about what is the proper attitude, what is the uh, type of conduct and worship that we should be rendering. And so the emphasis here is on uh, avoiding situations that might offend someone and cause division in the church. Uh, that's why... Uh, you hear me warning about contentious uh, church meetings where folks uh, say things, uh, ask things, uh, be answered to us in, uh, in a certain way that uh, can cause division. So he's emphasizing here is avoid doing those things that will cause division in the church. Um, we um, we can ask, you know, what appears to be an innocent question, but what is the motive behind that question? What is the motive between or behind, rather? Uh, your criticism of something that has taken place. Now, be mindful that in the in the church uh, piety, uh, it's all about majority rule, and so when the majority agrees upon something, that's really it. That's really the the finality of it is when the majority come to an agreement on a particular issue. And then to have someone continue to harp on it and harp on it and harp on it is really uh, just wrong because the majority has come into an agreement. And so we have to balance our freedom in Jesus Christ uh, knowing that what we do and what we say in the midst of carrying out church functions, that we have the right attitude and the right conduct. So in verse 2, Paul says, uh, now I can commend you because you remembered me in everything and maintained the tradition even as I delivered them to you. Um, the believers have been told uh, by Paul to follow the Christian teachings that he had passed on to them. Uh, Hebrews uh, 13 talks about remembering the one that brings you the word. The way that I, uh, the, the reason why I preach the way that I do now uh, is because of uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, where the folk, people had gathered together, and Ezra, the, uh, the priest, was asked to step up to the podium. 
and the Bible says that he stepped up to the podium and began to uh, proclaim, to teach the word of God. And the Bible says this, he made them to understand. In other words, as the men and the women stood up at the reading of the word. Again, this is why when you go to churches and they read the scripture, the people stand. That's where they get that from, standing at the reading of the word of God, standing out of respect and um, devotion to the word. And he made them to understand, which means that he, he made it plain. He made it simple. And so my philosophy is that uh, the reason why I preach and teach the way I do is because of that. I want folks to understand whatever it is that I'm saying. I want it to be understood. So I want, so I seek, <clears throat> I seek uh, clarity and, and wisdom in proclaiming the word so that when you leave church uh, and someone says to you, um, I was church today, and then they would ask, what did the preacher talk about? What did the preacher speak about? That you can recall and share that. Uh, that's why we have those, uh, that portion in the bulletin to, to make a little notes about, uh, about the sermon to help you understand so that you can go back and read it for yourself because my goal is to rightly divide the word so that you can understand. And so he says, uh, he's talking about Christian teaching and Christian teachings that he had already previously passed on to them it's because he used the term uh remember uh, i want you to remember this i want you to remember what does says the lord i want you to remember what i said as the preacher i want you to remember uh my explanation because if you're going if you're going to proclaim um uh, the gospel you also got to explain it. And then once you proclaim it and explain it, then you have to show, uh, speak to how it applies to the life of those who are hearing you. So that's what he's talking about. And that's my approach uh, to preaching and teaching. Uh, in verse three, uh, he said, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is a husband. And the head of Christ is God. Uh, so he, he he's speaking to authority. Uh, the ultimate authority is God himself. And he is over Christ, and Christ is over the church. After all, he did say upon this rock, this rock-like faith of Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. And so the church is built on faith. That is faith in him. Salvation is by way of faith in Jesus Christ the one that shed his blood, making the atonement for all of our sins. So man is responsible to Christ. The woman is responsible to her husband. And Christ is responsible to God, the Father. Uh, so he, he, you know, he, he, he's not here talking about a woman being submissive to a man, but rather he's talking about 
uh, how we should function, how we should be completing our functions in a way that glory can come out of the relationship. There ought to be glory coming out of the relationship between God the Father and Jesus Christ. There ought to be glory that comes out of the relationship between a man and a woman. And so uh, if there's going to be glory, then there's a certain order that God the Father has laid out for you and to laid out for me. And so nothing is more disrupted than our unwillingness to uh, respect and to hear the preacher or for a man to be disrespectful to a woman or a woman to a man. Because if we're all witnesses, then we're all in this uh, together. And so you cannot uh, be unified in fellowship in the church unless there's a mutual uh, respect and a mutual understanding in the relationships, God the Father, Christ to the church, and man to the woman. Uh, there has to be a uh, some understanding and the words that I used in the beginning was having a proper attitude. Having a proper attitude uh, toward God the Father, toward Jesus Christ the Son, and toward one another, especially when it comes to uh, public uh, worship. Uh, and so this is where he's starting to respond to that particular question. Okay, our time is uh, just about up here. So let me pause right there at verse 3 and ask if there's any questions as we wrap up tonight. Are there any questions? Okay. If not, then uh, let us pray. Lord, thank you again for what we have talked about tonight and what we have studied tonight. I pray again that you would open our understanding that we may receive the truth that is found in your word. Thank you for those who have participated tonight. I pray for their homes and their families in a special way that you would provide their every need, that you would protect them from all hurt, harm, and danger, that you would allow your spirit to be their, their guide that you would lead them in the way that you would have them to go. Thank you for what you have done for all my brothers and sisters. Thank you for what you will do in the days to come. Search their hearts and see whatever needs they may have. And in accordance with your will, I pray, O oh God, that you would grant it, not for our glory, but for your glory. Now let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be found acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good night, everybody. Amen. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.